I believe that Ghost Dog and Snow Rabbit is quite a strong option as far as tech guards go in this upcoming format. Welcome back guys, and as promised, following up our meta deck tier list, we got our staple tier list. So while the usage of some of these cards will change upon the deck that you choose to pilot, I'm going to go over all the possible staples and techs that we've seen in past formats and the most commonly used ones, and then see how they stand up to today's format. Against the Fire King decks, against Snake Eye, against Labyrinth, against Rescue Ace, all these sort of decks that, you know, we talked about in the last video. And so let's talk about the five categories we have here. We got the best staples. These are the ones you should see in a lot of main decks, uh, assuming you can play it. For example, like Dimension Shifter is probably going to be in that category, but you can't use it in many decks. We got strong options, so decks that could be in the main deck, but are also likely to be in side decks. Again, assuming you can play it. Has some merit or cards that are more niche, and we will see popping up from time to time, but I wouldn't consider them too common. And then we got subpar choice, which may be very rarely included in decks, but are unlikely to be a real viable option for you to play. And then we have the bad cards, which are cards which I shouldn't expect to see at all in people's decks, main or side. And yeah, there's plenty of cards to go here. So like last time, this will be a long video. I will try and explain everything as thoroughly as possible. And if you enjoyed that type of video, just please let me know. But otherwise, let's go. Let's get going because this will take quite a while. Anyways, let me explain what I'm talking about here. As for Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit, this card has been a card that I give a lot of hate towards for quite a while. I, I generally have talked about it as a card that I don't think does enough because you're not negating the effect. It often ends up being worse than a negation and it's just met removal because its activation window is so strict. However, I think right now it has a couple of unique advantages. Now, where I like it now and why I like it now, despite the fact that OCG isn't really playing it, is it's fairly flexible in what it can do. You're not really using this as a typical hand trap uh, to break apart their combo or to prevent them from playing. I'm using this almost as a board breaker. So there's the obvious application that if Fire King Island is used without a Fire King Sanctuary in the field, Ogre ruins them because this negates the island for all intents and purposes. And then will also trigger the island's mandatory effect to destroy every monster on their field. Doing so is really good. I shouldn't have to say that. There's other cards that do a similar job. Cosmic Cyclone destroys the field as well. However, if they do one of the aggressive plays to use Snake Eye Ash to send off the Sanctuary, they go Flame Merge and do all that stuff, then Ogre hits them like a truck. It's actually insane. However, that's not the main reason here. That's just the random upside that if they play into it, it pans out pretty well. The biggest thing I like about it is against cards like IP Mascarena, SP Little Knights, and Appaloosa. All three linked monsters are somewhat weak to Ghost Dog, right? SP, the on summon effect, is not, but the other effect is. Assuming they target itself, they usually do. But Mascarena, if you Ogre, will turn that off. And similarly, if they use Appaloosa's negated card, Ogre will turn that off. And one of the things that I'm looking for in a format is finding something I'm comfortable playing that fits several different roles. For one, I wanted to be able to deal with Appaloosa, because if I can't prevent them from making a field, and that's the card they end on, and it's hard to deal with an engine. It's something that you're not engine ideally, either prevent them from getting there, or you have a way to deal with it. I wanted to do one of the two, those two things, and Ogre beats Appaloosa. And what it also has to do, though, is I have to make sure that it's playable going first, because if it's not, then it can also work to my detriment, where if they have a lot of non-engine, and I have dead cards, I'm unfavored. And then I also want it to be somewhat usable versus cards like Droll and Anna Spell. That's a big problem with a lot of these board breaker spell cards. Thrust is the biggest one. So that's what had me thinking at looking to Ghost Ogre. And while this card isn't currently in my UDS deck, or if it's uh, after the fact in the time you're seeing this, I do think it is a relatively strong option that I seriously considered for the tournament. And if I had more time, there's a good chance it'd be in there. I think it has several applications. And if you draw this going first, it does have good defensive applications as well. Now, like I said, you want to use it aggressively to beat Appaloosa and stuff, but Outside of pairing it with a nib, you can also use it on stuff like Selene, which is insane. On a Charmer, it's fine. They get the search, but they, they won't get to resolve the Charmer because it has to go to a zone. And then also clear two Link bodies off the field. Or even if they go Princess and you Ghost Ogre that, that can be good because the Princess, it'll remove three Link material from the field. And while that's not brilliant, it definitely does far more than a dead Thrust, for example. Yeah, I would recommend trying this card out. It's something that's been hyped up a little bit since the first weekend regionals. And at the time of filming this, I'm not sure if we've seen it being played any of the YCS or UDS tournaments. I'm curious to see if it ended up showing up everywhere, but I think this is one of the sleeper picks right now. Next up is Call by the Graves. This seems like a staple in a lot of decks. And the start of the format, I was very eager to include it in my strategies. Turning off hand traps is great to force your combos through. Then going second, you can do stuff like Call by Princess, the Runix, Kieran, Amblo Whale, 
those type of cards and theoretically help you break through fields as well. So it's not like solo purpose and going first. However, in most cases, I actually found this wasn't that good. Assuming you're playing a fire deck, you don't want to turn off your princess. And that's the main card you'd want to be call buying. And then when you're going first, you're often weak to cards like Nibiru or Imperm, and this doesn't check those at all. I actually just didn't like call by when I was playing with it. I felt like it was just worse than cross out, and it really wasn't that good going second. It's one of those cards that again didn't deal with the Appalooza thing, which I went to my non-engine to do. And while this card has some merit to it, I ultimately think it is just worse than a lot of other cards. And despite it seeming like it should be good in a format like this, I just don't think it actually is powerful enough in the situations where it's good. And I think it actually has too many restrictions on when it's usable for it to be fully good. Next up is Mistaken Arrest. All right, so this one has been trending downwards for a while, and I think that it's going to continue being the case here. But it's nice, again, Floodgate-esque effects that are lingering, meaning your opponent can't deal with them after the fact. However, this does come back to bite you in your own turn as well. So after you shut them down for a turn, it will come back to you. And if you got hand trapped and you needed a floodgate to buy a turn for you, this wouldn't be great because now then it comes back to bite you in the ass, unlike something like Different Dimension Ground, which will hit them for one turn. And then when it gets back to you, you'll be free to play. I think if you wanted to go for one of those lingering floodgates, Different Dimension Ground is just way better. Although obviously that can have some ramifications on your end. I think this is just a bad choice that are far better. Even Different Dimension Ground isn't fantastic and... Yeah, the different ups other upside to Different Dimension Ground, which I don't think I've included on here, is that you can thrust for it. And I'd probably put it in there because of that. But, so Different Dimension Ground, if I put on here, I guess I forgot about it, would go here. A Mistaken Arrest doesn't have that upside, and it, it hurts you as well. We're going to put it in the bad category. Next up is... Oh god, I hate this card so much. And so yeah, this card's been popping up a lot in, in OCG. And in the last few weeks in OCG, we've seen the trend of some decks dropping Anti Spell in favor of other counter traps like Solemn Strike or Solemn Judgment. It's ju judgment here, right? Now, the reason for that is similar to the problem with the Mistaken Arrest. If you get hand trapped a lot, Anti Spell with no field is a lot worse. Now, it can still stop your opponent from playing and can buy you time, but it's not always the case. And a simple Snake Eye Ash means getting to something like SP Little Knight. And effectively, denying the Anna spell from any real value. Uh, you have to pair it with other cards then for it to be useful when it's not really one when you're looking for a bomb siding card for going first. Although when people, or if people, transition to the board breaker strategies, cards like Super Polymerization, Thrust, Talents, Change of Heart, those type of cards, then Anna spell is brilliant. That being said though, if you're in a very hand trap heavy meta and we are focusing entirely on hand traps, it actually just isn't the correct trap choice in my opinion. It's not terrible, but it's lackluster. And that's why we've seen Summon Limit, Strike, and Judgment all see some sort of play. This, this card's by no means bad, but it's not this omnipotent threat that's going to be in, in every single deck. I think it, it is a strong option and will be present in many side decks, but it is not the only and by far and away best choice as far as go first side card is. Next up is Ash Blossom. All Faithful. Yeah, so we're rarely going to see this card be a completely terrible choice in a format. I do think it's also rare to see it be one of the best staples. I actually think there are other hand traps that are better than this card and don't actually love it, but I think you are forced to play a very hand heavy hand trap meta in that this is up there. It's, it's probably the hand trap I play fourth, but if you're playing a deck, you want to have 12 hand traps or, or upwards of that, then, then Ash Blossom is where you want to be. My biggest problem with Ash is it, it by itself doesn't really do enough versus a lot of these decks. Ashing Snake Eye Ash isn't fantastic because its on-field effect still exists, and that can be a problem even if they don't have on fire, so they can do other stuff to start playing a little more than you'd like. And then obviously there's also Hita. If your opponent Hita's your Ash, then it gives them plus one link material to bridge into Princess, which in a lot of cases can be hard when you're getting hand trapped. So that ability to go into Princess and really ramp up your, your follow-up and your disruption is, is dangerous. So when Ash is your only hand trap, it's not super comfortable. However, it is still good because if you Ash like a Sinful Spoils, then you can often deny a Fire King deck of access to the Fire King cards. They'll be locked in a Snake Eye engine, which while powerful, is not the end of the world. You can beat through that with engine or if you have other hand traps, it's a lot easier to deal with. They also have less resiliency and follow-up without the Fire King cards. No, again, it's not zero. Those, that deck is still good. It's pretty much just playing pure Snake Eye at that point, but Ash does help you to some degree there. So yeah, it should be in pretty much every everyone's deck. You'd have to be playing no hand traps for that to be the case. And there's merit to that. And I strongly debated putting it as, as a strong option, but ultimately if I think that 80% of decks need to have 12 plus hand traps, and this will be one of those 12 hand traps, 
Even if it's at the end of the best staples, it is one of the best staples. As a dimensional barrier, we are in a very link heavy format, and I think a lot of extra decks have 15 links or 14 links and almost nothing else. And as a result, barrier is just not very good. The extra deck decks may include two elements, but barrier has never been brilliant versus that deck. It's been okay. If you want other floodgates, again, stuff like different dimension ground is just better. But yeah, I think you can very easily put this in a bad spot. I'd say this is the worst one we've had to deal with yet. Which is surprising because if you go back six months, this card was an absolute menace. But that's how metas evolved. So it's interesting to look back on how things have changed so drastically so quickly. We got a new one now, and that is the Black Goat Laughs. So for those of you that don't know, it lets you declare a card name, and then your opponent cannot, or neither player, can summon monsters with that card's name for the rest of the turn, except from the grave. But it also has a graveyard effect, and you can banish it to declare a card name, or monster name, and then neither player can activate the monster's effects in the field this turn. It has some interesting uses, and it's very unique in its properties, almost Prohibition-esque. Now, the on-field effect is actually lacking in many cases, because letting your opponent still be able to summon from the grave means, in especially a fire-based format, stuff like Promethean Princess, like discarding with Phoenix, then Princess Revive pretty much turns off all of its uses. However, its graveyard effect can be pretty good. Now, there's too many threats in the Fire King deck for it to be actually good versus Fire King. However, something like Rescue Ace, hitting Turbulence can be quite good. That being said, you have to get into the grave. So how easy is that? And that's going to rely a little more on synergies and it becomes less of a staple at that point. We're talking about it within the context of Labyrinth. It's a pretty cool card. It's it's solid. And it, it's similar to the Shuffler where it's good value to discard the Furnitures, but it's also some playability when you draw it. That being said, I think it is not the best position right now. It's a subpar choice, and I, I really wouldn't include this in many cases. I have seen some people use this as a thrust target, because if you thrust for going first, it's an okay disruption. As we said, it's okay. But then going second, you can send it off of a witch, or it's just witch. You send it for witch, and then you can use it as a bit of a board breaker, almost calling something like Appaloosa or Garunix or IEP to help push through a little bit. And while it may not do an awful lot, it will do something. And then when this specifically can come up even more is if you thrust, but you got drolled. So if you got drolled and you have a thrust now, whereas it wouldn't done anything before, if you have a witch plus a thrust in your hand, you can thrust for the black goat laughs, send it off, and it's something. Is it enough to win the game? Probably not, to be honest, if you're playing through your field, and that's why I still don't think it's worth playing that type of engine, but it is something that exists. Next up is Cyframe Delta. So this is another one of the hand traps that is very strong right now. Hand traps are very well positioned. And it's seen quite a bit of play in OCG. Uh, and it, it does very similar things to Ash Blossom, where you can hit these sinful spoils to deny Fire King access. Uh, we can also have stuff like Cross Out, which can be very good at critical points. Uh, talents, when, when they go first, is pretty nasty. And then sometimes hitting the Fire King Island or Sanctuary can be pretty good, too. It's a, it's a valuable trap, hand trap. And when you play that, it also lets you play Gamma, which is broken. Whereas before, you wouldn't want to play Gamma with just the driver. So it actually has a lot of merits. Obviously, you don't want to main deck it because going first, this card is terrible. And you get into a grind game where you're trading hand traps, this does zero, and it's really not a card you want to draw. I would expect to see this in zero main decks, unless someone's blinding second. And in that case, I do expect to see it in a lot of side decks, though. I know that I'm playing it at my UDS, and we'll see how that went, but I do like it to bring my hand trap account up to a point where I'm approaching 80% chance of seeing multiple hand traps when I go second. And this is nice to pair. And now the upside where that it has compared to Ash is that it plays around... Tita. They can't Tita it. Now, the downside is, if they play Thrust post-side going first, which, albeit rare, can happen, it, it gives them a Thrust target to get Talents or any Stender they want. That can be pretty nasty. However, I'm expecting not as many Thrusts. I don't think the card is that great because of Anispal because of Droll. And then, if someone's playing Thrust, if they aren't playing a card like a Trap, like Daruma Cannon or Different Dimension Ground or Blackout Laughs to set off of Thrust, it's not going to be in their deck post-side. It's really not powerful enough as a sort of countermeasure to hand traps. And while they could possibly be playing these other traps, it's another spot of the side deck. It's another uh, deck building concession. So yeah, obviously it's not without risks. Any side from card has its risks, but I think the payoff is, is rather nice. Now, one other thing that can happen, which can be interesting, is uh, putting cards on the field on the, on the first turn opens your opponent up to doing Zelantis Princess stuff like immediately on their first turn. Which, it really isn't that, like, meaningful. It doesn't matter that much, but there's something funny that can happen that could matter. I don't know. Next up is Ghost Spell. It's a card that we've seen in a lot of side decks for a while now, uh, but I don't think it's that good. I think I'm going to put it in the Have Some Merit section, and the reason is I think this card does not do enough versus the Fire decks. Uh, hitting something like a Garunix or Kirin or P Princess Revive, it it's just not that good on the first turn. Like, or hitting even a flame burge if you can sometimes it's chain blocked 
it, it really doesn't function hard enough as a hand trap. Uh, I think oftentimes you're off, better off using it to, to bell Princess Revive effect, at which point I'd rather crow. Uh, and even then, that's also just still not a very strong board breaker. If I'm, if I'm playing it as a board breaker, I have to understand that's what I'm using it for. And then in the context of a board breaker, it's just not good. So I would never really have this card in my side deck for Fire King. At which point would I main it? No. Why would I play this card then? If you side deck it, it should be for the express purpose of Labyrinth. And we saw that before when Labyrinth was a lot more popular and it was way stronger of a deck. That's a big reason why Bell was in side decks. However, if you check out my last video, my last meta tier list about the decks of the meta, I think Labyrinth is rather lowly rated. And unless your deck has a hard time with Labyrinth or you really want to prepare for it heavily, I, I wouldn't put too much into it. And then even when it comes to this card versus other decks like Voices Voice, it, it is usable, but it's not fantastic. It can get them off guard pretty nicely if they play with the Dynamondo line, but that's not a given. And if you like Bell, the effect of low to come back when it's ritual summoned, they are extenders to keep playing. Like if they have the trap, like if they open the spell, they would just get the trap off the first low, and then that can just get a second low to mitigate your bell, <laughs> at which point you're trading down a card. You're trading one for one in a way that's not meaningful. That's exactly what that deck wants you to do. Yeah. I'm not happy with Bell in, in any of these scenarios. It's really just Labyrinth. And once you understand that, and you also realize that Labyrinth isn't even that good or that popular right now, I would stay away from Bell. Now, obviously, as I'm filming this, there's the events that are about to happen. I'm curious if I'm proved wrong, if this card is going to be very popular, or if Lab is going to be that popular, but I really don't see Lab as being this huge meta threat at the moment. Next up is Forbidden Chalice. Okay, notice how I've been talking about this is a very handshake heavy format. I don't like a lot of board breakers right now, and I, I think a large part of it is the presence of Anti Spell and Joel Lockbird. Chalice was going to have similar problems. It's a little better versus Anti Spell because you can chain it, but sometimes you can't hit stuff like the IP because that'll still be in Spell Trap Card Zone until after everything's resolved. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, it's also just not very powerful. The thing is, like, if, if your opponent goes full combo and you have a Chalice, trading one for one is fine but it's not great i'd like it to be doing something else and it doesn't have the high roll potential that ghost ogre does to just end them if they aren't playing around that properly and at the same time i also think it's worse as a disruption when you go first so i think this card is just subpar i'm not huge on it yeah i don't know much to say it's just i think effect negation is, is fine is pretty good right now as a hand trap but not as a breaker that's for dark ruler no more you get to turn off their entire field but you don't deal damage in that turn. And that's a big problem because it's pretty easy for these fire decks to play for follow-up. So if you're dark them, it's almost the same thing as SPing them. And oftentimes we want to avoid doing that because you want to kill them. Uh, it's a lot easier to kill them than it is to shut them off of follow-up with disruptions. Or if it's enter a grind game. If you're very comfortable entering a grind game and your deck is built to do maybe Dark Ruler can be more impactful. Or if your deck has great ways of shutting out the opponent after you've turned off their negates, Dark Ruler has more merit. Now, obviously, if you're doing this, you have to play through the princess still. One thing I don't like is if you have, if they have an Arvada up, even though you Dark Ruler negate it, but when the Princess pop the Arvada, the Gurunix will come back, they'll pop a card with the Kirin, and then Arvada comes back again. But you're really not dealing with the Arvada if that's what they're rendering on. Uh, however, if it's like Flame Burge, Apo, or something like that, then you are dealing with both those threats. I think this card is just a subpar choice. Again, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the Breakers, and it has the same weakness to Anti Spell. Next up is Cosmic Cyclone. Cosmic has been an extremely popular card in a lot of decks recently, and there's a good reason why. So post side, it's great to pair with other stuff. If your opponent's field is any bit weaker, this card will put them in the ground. Or if their field is strong and you have this plus talent or, or breaker, it can be fantastic. And now what are you doing? What am I? Why, why am I saying that? Because it's fire King hitting fire King island nukes the field, so it punishes an Appaloosa line a lot. Uh, it really will force people towards playing stuff like Ambler Whale or just effects that aren't as overwhelming to your uh, as disruptions. And that's obviously positive. But even when they don't do that, Cosmic can still hit stuff like. Anti spell. It can still hit sets like Imperm. It can still hit the card that they put with Flame Bridge, so if they have an IP there. So it's very versatile in that way. As a going first card, people have talked about how it could be playable, but it really, Cosmic King, like a Poplar or a Sanctuary, while it has some usage, really isn't good enough for to warrant play. If your opponent's getting that far enough, you want more impactful disruption. I think that's why we're going to see it not be in main decks. Uh, one of my favorite things to pair Cosmic with, though, is Cosmic and Talents, because you Cosmic the Island, you force them to. Trigger all their effects, and then Talents can tear them apart. Uh, if you feel like you can beat the board, you go after their hand, clear out the hand trap, and then it should be pretty good. Now, one new counterplay we are seeing is people using Relinquished Anima and I'm a Unicorn to do a play where you shuffle back your Fire King Island, get the draw off Unicorn, and because cards don't trigger from the deck, uh, the island won't nuke the field, at which point Cosmos Cyclone becomes a lot worse. 
Uh, that being said, the, there's still the other targets for it that still exist. So unless they choose not to end on Flame Burge, they, end, they don't have any back row. Um, the Cosmic will still have usage. It's not like it's completely futile and it's not completely dead. So yeah, very strong option for now. That being said, I think it'd be very extreme to play around just Cosmic Cyclone. And that's not what we're going to see happen. Next up is Droll and Lockbird. So I said before how there were the 12 hand traps I wanted to include in most decks. The next best one I think is Droll and Lockbird. Droll is weird. I think it's one of the worst ones to pair, which is not normal. Usually Droll paired is insane. But I think when you pair Droll now, it's not always the best because if you have Valor Imperm plus Droll, you either, if you're letting the Ash resolve, Snake Eye Ash, and then you're drawing them there, then the Valor Imperm does a lot less. If you're, if you're Valoring or Imperm in the Ash, then the Droll is not being used, right? It is inefficient. And it, it, it is weird for Droll in that spot. However, Droll can be the one to solo hands by itself as well. I guess a lot of the hand traps can. And when you go first, Droll is nuts. It can be used as a hand trap and it can definitely help lighten boards up. And then when you go first, it is insane, I think, because it's, it's not, it makes it way hard for them to kill you. And even if they don't kill you, but they just make a small field, you can usually play back to that relatively easily. And then another thing it does is similar to Ash, is while it's not great at like pairing or doing everything, it does shut off the Fire King cards pretty well. Again, if you draw them when they add Poplar, then they don't get to Ponix or whatever. Or even if they open Ponix, they can't resolve Island. It is a great way of stopping that from resolving. I think sometimes versus Fire King, draw can be better than Ash, but in simplified game states, Ash is better, and versus the broad meta, Ash is better as well. Versus the Pure Snack Edict, draw is just not good. I expect to be Droll in many decks. It's probably one of the best strong options, but there are reasons not to play this card. I would put it there comfortably. Next up is Contact C, and similar to Barrier, we are in a Link format. Everything is generic. Princess is generic. This card is just bad. Yeah, not good at all. Not going to waste time explaining that one. Next up is Book of Eclipse. All right, so with Link formats, it's a bit weird with book monsters. Sorry, with book cards. Because you can't wait to hit cards later. Like you can't wait for a Pearly X Seed. You can't wait for the Unchained X Seed. You can't wait for the Cash X Seeds to really get value. And booking straight away doesn't always turn off their plays. They can extend from the hand. Not guaranteed, but relatively often. And the other issue with book cards is they, they don't always actually cut off a resource. What I'm saying is if you book a Snake Eye Poplar, you may think, okay, it's gone for the rest of the turn. Cards like Island or Die Star can still clear it off the field in engine and then put it back in the grave to keep using. It's not actually that simple. If you could say Book of Flame Burge and then never have to deal with the effect resolving, that would have a lot more merit, but it's just not what happens. And then as a board breaker versus stuff like Appaloosa versus IP, it's not very good. Uh, you can, I guess versus IP, it's okay. You can maybe catch your opponent off guard if they go IP effects and you book all their monsters and the Forged Link IP plus Appaloosa, and that could be neat. And it can turn off Princess as well sometimes. So it, versus Breaker, it's like not the worst, but it's, a, it's not the best either. And versus Nana Spell, obviously it's chainable, but again, if you can't like make him get, get max value out of it, it can kind of be funky. And then with, with Board Breakers as well, is if the boards aren't standardized and they're very uh, mixed in what they do, it, it's rough, right? Like your opponent doesn't end on a Fire Link Monster or a way to end a Fire Link Monster or a Kieran in the hand. Eclipse could be good because you could turn off a lot of their interruptions, no Princess anymore, which also means no Garunix line and... Yeah, I mean, it's the same way how resolving as Atlantis to put all the monsters face down could be good. But if they end on like an Amblo Whale, then Eclipse looks silly because Princess and all that stuff is still going to be a threat. But yeah, this card is subpar choice. I think you're making a big gamble on a board breaker that's probably not even worth it. Although you get to use it going first, which is nice. Next up is Change of Heart. This is a board breaker that I've toyed around with for a little bit. And why I think it could be good is if you're playing a very heavy board breaker deck in conjunction with Thrust or Talents, it, it will force your opponent to do something. And if your opponent's ending on Appaloosa, this card is nasty, right? Just change a hard steel Appaloosa is, is insane for the fact that it's a negate. And then even if it's impermed later, turning that Appaloosa into his Atlantis pressures even more, right? If your opponent hasn't used Princess yet and they have no links that aren't, or no, sorry, no fire link monsters, then Zalantis can turn their fires face down and then you can go from there. So it forces Princess out and pretty good. But, and spell exists. So does Draw, right? If, and Draw matters because if you're trying to thrust for cards, right? If I'm trying to combo this with a uh, change of heart plus thrust, I go change of heart like a, a Amblo Whale, and they chain Kieran, then if the goal is to thrust, and then I'm getting drolled afterwards, like it hurts me a lot. Like now I can't Ash, can't Bonfire, and it's just nasty. Now there are workarounds. We've seen a lot of people play stuff like Engage to draw with thrust. It's another package that if you went for that, which is a lot powerful, and those are the type of decks you'd see these heavy spells in. I think those normal spell type strategies are gonna be pushed aside because they unfortunately just can't risk these two cards existing. And yeah, there could be an event where it's just a very good meta call for these spells because people aren't prepared for them anymore. And that could absolutely happen. I would not be surprised 
but at least for the current moment when it's a little more undefined, you don't know what your opponent's ending on either, and there's still drolls and Anna spells everywhere. I'm I'm not I'm not including this likely in, in my deck, but it has merit. It has some merit. Next up is Cashier Fenrir, and I've been a very big critic of this card. I think this card as a non-engine card is lackluster. I think going first, it is mediocre disruption, and if your deck is already weak to Nibiru, then you're playing into Nibiru even more because if you get Nibiru, you're losing the card and accomplishing nothing out of it. And as for going second, this just gets obliterated by Princess or SP. It, it really isn't like super high functioning. Adding the card to hand off Fenrir, like if that resolves, isn't very good. Also plays into Droll. I, I, there's just no reason to play this card. I think this card is just bad. It may even be, it may be subpar, but I think this card is just bad. I, I think it shouldn't really be in anybody's deck unless you are a cash tier player. If you have that as an engine, then fantastic. But it should not be your non-engine cards. There are just way better options. Next up is DD Crow. And this card is relatively popular, but I think this card is just not very good. It has some merit, but I'm going to put it in subpar choice to really get across to you guys. I think this card is heavily overrated. As far as disruption goes, it really doesn't do a lot. Sometimes you can crow them to stop a flame bridge from resolving because they only have two fires in grave, but that's not what's going to happen. Crowing the fire king target can keep them off of one body. But the thing is, your hand trap is not stopping them from playing. It's keeping them off of one body, which will really shut them down. They may have a slightly weaker field, but it's not much. Alternatively, you can use it aggressively to crow Princess or Garunix as a board breaker. But again, it's trading meh. It may be better than call by, but it's worse going first, and it's not functioning as a hand trap either, really. It's the same thing of like first tier. It's not like it seems like it should be fine, but it doesn't do enough to, for it to actually be good or for me to actually want to play it. And I think this card just shouldn't be in your decks for those reasons. Yeah, I don't really have much positive to say about Crow. The one thing that I do like about it is if you're playing a Pure Snake High deck and you want to include Wear of Thou's as a way of giving yourself more engine, more ways to play through stuff like Imperm, or more ways to play through stuff like Valor. What Crow can do is it means when you go second, you can play one of Crow in your deck. And now if you have Wear of Thou and you don't need more engine you can wear art thou for dd crow deal with the princess and that could be pretty good and there is some merit to that and in that case it's a utility tech card where it's like a one of thing you, you grab same way as you'd have the dual different dimension ground for thrust very similar but to probably even less frequent extent next up we got cross up designator which has been staple in ocg for pretty, pretty much every deck because of maxi but i think it is outside of that also very good here and if we're going to a very heavy hand trap meta and we're expecting post side to see a lot of hand traps, cross up's a great way of pushing through your hand traps. Specifically, if our deck is weak to impermanent beard, which I think are great hand traps right now, uh, having the way to stop those hand traps is fantastic. Cross out does that, right? Like, we able to stop those where other hand traps were also in an almost, or really we are just in a tier zero meta. Being able to hit like a poplar or a snake eye ash or a fire king island, I don't know how much I do that. Crossout acts almost like a solemn judgment, although not for summons. It could be very good. So I think Crossout is one of the absolute best cards aside going first. That being said, it obviously has the issue where it's not actually that good going second. If you hit like a Runix or a Karen to stop that from resolving or Nirvana, it's meh. It also shuts you off using the rest of the turn or if the banish it from your deck, right? Which isn't always fantastic. So I, I wouldn't be like too keen on throwing this in as a sidek option for going second, but I do think it's great going first. Uh, that's weird. This was in my main deck for the UDS tournament. I don't think it is as good as the 12 hand traps. I feel are more mandatory. And if you're not playing a fire deck, then I think cross out just isn't that good either. Next up, we got Harpy's Feather Duster. Okay, so versus the fire decks, I want to duster them. They have Sanctuary Duster is not very good. The Flame Birch can chain to bring up the IP or Arvada, whatever's in spell trap card zone. Versus the fire decks, this really doesn't accomplish much, right? So we'd have to be playing for something else. Versus Labyrinth, I actually think this card is not that good. I'd rather have Cosmic, rather have Bell. If I want cards for Labyrinth, there are better options than this, right? People aren't playing the Floodgate version as much. So you'd want this for some sort of other Floodgate deck, right? So if we're seeing Cash or, or Flunder show up in the meta as this anti-meta deck with D Fisher, maybe you want Duster, or even some limits on the Voices Voice deck. And it's okay in those matchups. And then the other time you'd want it is just Rescue Ace to clear all the back row. But there are other perfectly fine options that I think have a bit more merit to them and i don't know this card yeah it's not terrible it, it has some merit right but i think there is a very strong case for not being in your side deck right unless you really need to allocate spots to rescue ace or these labyrinth decks it just really isn't too important now obviously you should be building your deck for fire matchups so your side deck should be how or should have a lot of space for these other matchups and when that's the case then duster can make its appearance but for me at least duster is not in my deck at the moment next up is dark hole as far as breakers go this is Weird, right? Because if you're Cosmic and Fire King and that's acting as nuking their field, 
Dark Hole just seems worse because it's the same thing without the utility of hitting like the Flame Bridge back row or an anti spell. Yeah, no, this card just isn't great. It's it's like not. No, it's just bad. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know what I have to say. It's good about this. It's it's pretty bad. It's not like level of bad as maybe these two cards, but it's not good either. Um, it's not even a subpar choice. Like I, I I'd say all five of these are better than Dark Hole. Next up is Phantasma. It's a card that honestly I haven't given enough lights. I haven't given it a, a chance enough to see how good it is. Uh, I know some people have liked it. My biggest problem with it though is it's not directly hand trap itself, so it's not going to be usable. So it, it's not going to be the card that stops them from playing. Uh, typically, I like this card more with board breakers, which if I'm trending away from, uh, I'm not a huge fan of. However, in a board breaker deck, it's great. The other problem though is it's weaker to Towns and Thrust. One of the advantages of playing a board breaker deck is not having a weakness to those cards. I'm not a fan of that. And in hand trap decks, if you're drawing into hand traps to them, one, you're turning off Imperm, and if you're playing post side, Delta slash Gamma. And then also, you you can't use the hand traps in, a, in the most opportunity spots, right? Because if they've gone into a Link Monster, they've gone through quite a bit of their plays, right? Droll would do a lot less as well. Veiler would be a lot less impactful. The only one that really maintains the same level of impactfulness would be like Inabiru. Unless that's the only card you ever want to see and you really need to dig for it, I wouldn't love Phantasma too much. But I do know many people who like it. And if you can use it as a breaker almost, some places where it is cool, where if it's your turn and your opponent uses Flamers or Summon IP, assuming you can either stop an Apo or they don't have it, Phantasmate there can be really good because then it'll let you draw three cards and cycle back two to really fix your hand, and then it still has the prevention of targeting, so you can prevent like so you can prevent like a princess from coming down. In those spots, it's fantastic. However, without a uniform end field, it's not great. And again, that is also weak to draw and lockbird, right? If you get drawled before that point, then Phantasma is going to send your hand dead, and I'm not happy with that as a result either. I guess if you're committed to that as a board breaker strategy, then maybe, but. That's my biggest apprehension with playing Phantasme. Lava Golem. Imagine clearing your opponent's field and then giving them a fire for Princess. I can tell you guys pretty confidently. Uh, unless you have a, another matchup where you want this card. Like, the thing is though, I don't know, what would it be? I guess if it's Voices Voice. I'm giving you Normal Summon is so much. It has to be a better card if it's Voices Voice. But the thing is like Super Poly and such isn't always good if it's Voices Voice. Because they can use the, the Ritual Spell on the Grave to summon another from deck. Where Lava Golem's not a card effect, you'd be bypassing that, that downside or that upside that they have. And that would give this card a little more merit, but I don't know. It has to be something better to play than Lava Golem in those spots. I don't know. I'll, actually, I'm going to put it here. I, I think, I don't know. I, it's better than, than I thought about now that I think, now, now that I've given it some chance to sit in my mind. It is terrible for everything else. Don't get me wrong. But maybe versus Tear or versus Minadium, you can stick this in. And versus Voiceless. Not, don't love it, though. Don't get me wrong. Next up is the Ruma Cannon. The Ruma Cannon right now. I mean, it's the same as Eclipse, right? Eclipse is not very strong. This is the same, but it's not a board breaker at any capacity at all. And, and while Eclipse has some ability to use it going second, Duma really doesn't. If you want a, a thrust target, it should be a different dimension ground. I guess if you really don't want a different dimension ground yourself, it, it can be the Ruma. But if you're playing like a Snake Eye deck and you got hand trapped into the, the point where you can't play, then thrusting for DDG is fine. You're not actually harming, harming your, yourself at all. So I wouldn't want to play Karma Cannon for that reason, but... Yeah, no, this is just not powerful enough. Better than Barrier, but... Next up is Deck Lockdown. Another broken floodgate that stops stuff from being played. Uh, and this card is cool because it can stop the summoning from deck as well. So if your opponent has monsters like Snake Eye Ash, fantastic. However, what it doesn't do is, unlike something like Summon Limit, which floods your opponent out, those cards can be sent off by your own Snake Eye effects to special from deck and then unlock yourself. Um, deck Lockdown can't do that because if you have a Snake Eye Ash in the field, you can't activate the effect with Deck Lockdown. And then you are locking yourself. So if you get into a grind, it can be a lot more impactful on yourself. And the same reason why Mistaken Arrest isn't very good. This card isn't good either. I guess it's a bit more impactful than Mistaken Arrest, but no, not a huge fan. And the next one is another controversial decision, and that is Super Polymerization. I think this card is subpar. I think this card really is overrated. And I can't put my finger on why the OCG loved this card so much. And maybe after two weekends of playing a bit more, my opinion will have changed. But every time I've tested this card, it feels if I'm playing Breakers... This card doesn't do enough. The Mud Dragon, seemingly good on first appearance that you summon off it, will die to Kieran a lot of the time and then become, you know, just another thrown away body, at which point they'll be able to re-trigger all their effects and it's just not that hard for them to deal with. Amblo Whales as well. Like, even if they're, they're, they have other stuff, they could just Amblo Whale pop and, again, you don't have the Mud Dragon anymore. It doesn't target. So not huge on it from that standpoint. And one thing with Board Breakers as well, is you have to deal with their board plus hand traps, right? And that can be rather hard. So you're probably just guarding a card, you're going a card down. You now, if you're playing Witch as well, you're another card down. If you're playing with Witch especially, you're calling Dark to protect from Imperm. If not, then you're calling Fire. But then the Witch is still vulnerable. Don't love that either. 
And if you're trying to keep up with the Mud Dragon's way to stop fires and then from targeting fires, it almost can't be interacted with as your own body either. So you have to do everything else with the Mud Dragon still on the field. And that's really not that easy. What I also don't like about it is using up your extra deck spaces, which are very valuable in fire decks. And then versus Voices Voice, again, the Ritual spell offsets it greatly. I, I, as, a, as a going first card, it's like fine, but if you want to play Garura to make it a good going first card, that's another extra deck spot. To beat some end fields, are you playing the Earth Gold Magic Mister to beat like Appalooza plus IP? I, again, like. It's just more extra spots, and you really can't afford it in that many decks. Now, there are some decks where you can't afford it. In that case, this deck, this card's merit goes up. I really just think oftentimes it's not enough as a board breaker, and it's just an okay back row. And then also the deck building cost that it, you know, pushes onto you is not worth it in so many decks. I think it's really low end of has some merit, high end of subpar choice. And it will be in a bunch of decks, but I expect to see it be drop, dropping off a lot in terms of playability and how often it's represented as we progress further into the meta. Next up is Sphere Mode. You can't even do this with Voices Voices much. I'm going to put this... I don't know. Yeah, no, bye. I, I'm not going to get too much time to this. Same as Lava Golem. I'm not giving them the fire, I guess, though. But it, if you're trying to kill them, killing, trying to kill them through this is also a pain in the ass. I guess, like, you'd have to go to Atlantis and summon to face down. That, that works. I'm sure. Next up is Talents. This is a card that at the start of the format, I said would be one of the best staples. Or I thought so, at least. I don't know if I said it on Twitch or, or whatever. However, the more I'm playing and I'm struggling because a lot of my hands lose to Imperm, or I brick. Talents is one of the biggest contributors, right? With other hand traps, I can try and stay alive and fight back. The thrust or talents isn't. And then when I go second, talents isn't always a, the card that will win me the game, right? If I'm able to pair it with other stuff and the rest of my hand is okay, then talents can be very good. Don't get me wrong. But there are many games where your opponent plays properly around it. Talents won't be enough to recover. And at the same time, it's dead enough going first or contributing to bricks enough going first that I'd almost rather have a hand trap. Now, when it resolves, it can be very strong, and it can be what pushes you to success when you go first, being able to play through multiple hand traps. It can be what lets you break through fields when you pair it, and when, and if you want a powerful spell that breaks fields, I think this is the strongest one. But I only think it is not actually the best staple, and it has enough flaws in it that there are merits to not including it in your deck, main or side. Next was Herald the Abyss, and this card isn't good, unfortunately. There's way too many different cards in play, and there's not any one overwhelming Oppressive card, it's not like you're dealing with an Arise Heart or a Caesar even or a Noir. That stuff's all kind of phased out. We're dealing we're not dealing with these one card fields anymore. It's very diverse boards. And in that case, this card just does not do it. As it was Vados. Alright, so this is a brand new one. Pretty similar to Ogre, right? Where you can pop a field spell to summon it to your opponent's field, but if they link away with it or it goes to your grave for any reason, it'll also nuke the field. But if you're nuking islands, it'll nuke everything. This card is cooler than Ogre in the sense that it can be used on activation of field spells. If you're playing versus Chalamets or Manadium, uh, you can hit their field spells, and it's pretty good. It's way better in those matchups than Ghost Ogre is. However, Vados versus Fire King Sanctuary is bad. Like, you aren't going to resolve anything. And Ogre has other applications to make up for it where Vados doesn't. So that's where I think Vados is just a bad choice right now. It's very unique, and I think one day this could be meta, especially in very field spell heavy, like, meta, but... Now we're not there, just the unique circumstances of Fire King Sanctuary existing. If it didn't, I think we could see this moved up even higher and this to be actual strong option. I feel like though, when this card is good, it'll be high up here. Uh, it'll be one of those cards that's very volatile in, in its playability. Next up is Marionette Might. I honestly should have removed this from my tier list. I didn't see it here until now. Uh, yeah, Unchained is not very popular. Labyrinth is not popular. Let's just put it this here. At the end, my bad. And Eradicator. Great. So another going first card that's, that's supposed to be impactful. However, there are a lot of monsters in people's decks. They can play with just Witch. They can chain Wanted to get a Witch. Snake Eye Ash still beats you. This cannot be your main line of defense. It cannot be it. While it's not the hardest thing in the world to activate, I would not want to dedicate extra spots to doing so. And there are just better traps to do it. So this card is just bad. Even a Labyrinth, I would not be fixating on resolving Eradicator. And there's no deck in the form that's really that spell heavy unless you're playing pure Snake Eye or Fire King Sna Snake Eye that is board breaker built. And in those cases, I transition and I spell. Only Labyrinth can maybe side deck that card for that matchup. Yeah, Ru Runic as well. Runic is not very popular. Next up is Kaiju, and in similar vein to Herald the Abyss, the single target removal is not going to cut it, and this is also just not in a strong manner. It has to bypass the Anna spell, but it's never going to be doing enough to be meaningful, so... Adios, Gamma Seal. Next up is Enemy Controller. This is a card that I thought would be a little bit better at the start of the format for stealing cards. However, it being targeting gives it some weaknesses to stuff like Kirin, as well as being able to have Tributing a monster is not great. With such powerful links, sacking off your own monster, unless they were about to target and destroy it, is actually ass. It is a valuable resource to be giving up that could have turned into a Charmer or into a Selene or into a Princess or into a Link 4. So if they target a Princess with an effect, chaining Egon to it doesn't feel that good. 
Um, sometimes getting the free value when I was about to die is nice, but when they're popping with a Kirin or an Ambler Whale, you don't have that luxury. You can't actually chain Econ there. Or at least you can't with, like, the knowledge of... the. You can't save your, mo you can't save your monster. You'll still get a card popped. Econ on Appaloosa can be very good. Or even Econ Steel, like your opponent's only fire monster turning off Princess can be very good when they don't have Kirin. Econ has a lot of power in those scenarios. And the other problem with it, though, is Anna Spell, right? And it's going to be a recurring thing, right? We're expecting Anna Spell in the meta. We want to make sure our cards are powerful enough. Now, one of the other upsides to Enemy Controller is when you go first, it is impactful. It's not brilliant, but Enemy Controller as a disruption is very good when you, when you get to play a bunch. And when you get hand trapped a bunch, even Econ Tribute like Snake Eye Ash is fine. Obviously, it requires you to be sacking off a body, which I don't love, but it's still okay. Next up is Forbidden Droplets. This is one that I know a lot of people are liking as well. It's a very high end of has some merit, or maybe even it's a strong option. It's one that I've not tested enough, but I know a lot of people enjoy or have been liking, partially because it isn't as weak to Anna Spell. And then unlike Chalice, they can't chain Flame Burge to it to bring out the IP, so you can actually hit Flame Burge in an effective manner in that way. Uh, and then you can hit multi-targets at once, right? So if they have Flame Burge Appaloosa, you can hit both of them together, or you can hit the Arvada and, and all that such. You can also combo together with normal spells or quick plays, so if you want it, you can send off that. They have three cards, like Bonfire, Chain Wanted, Chain Droplet. Send them off so they can chain anything and really shut them off. And that is, there is an obvious reason why it's better than Chalice in, in those regards. Going first, it's a bit more costly. And if you get disrupted, it is that you, to accomplish the same thing as Imprimer Chalice, you have to get throw another card. And those Grimes, you can perform rather poorly. I, I don't love that. And then it, my general thing is I don't love the Board Breakers as much because playing through the board plus the Hand Traps, if to play Hand Traps can be difficult. So... I think this is one of the stronger board breakers, and it does bypass some of the problems a lot of the other board breakers have. So you can almost put it here, and if I wasn't so strongly in favor of playing hand traps, I'd probably go up here. But yeah, I think as far as board breakers goes, Droplet is one of the best ones. Then we got Evenly Matched. This is a card I get on infinitely, and that will not change anytime soon. Yes, this is the type of format you think Evenly is good, because there's no way to negate it. There's a bunch of cards in the field. You get value out of it. However... There's still plenty of ways to play after evenly. There's still going to be more disruptions after the fact. They can keep stuff like Appaloosa. The Princess will still be there. If they have a Kirin in hand, it's not that hard for them to navigate around it. They have other hand traps. And the thing is, you give up your battle phase. That's a very powerful resource to either force through disruption or to win the game. Because if you can't kill them sometimes, they'll just have too much going for you to win in the long run. Even though evenly can get rid of some actual resources for the long game, it's often not enough. Yeah, I don't love the card. As far as other matchups go, it's still bad with Labyrinth. It's not good as Voiceless. So I'll just negate it. You can pair multiple things together, but it's still not great. Yeah, evenly, not a card I would put my faith in. Uh, nothing's changed there. We have the Super Ancient Organism. Uh, you can stop Flame Bird. You can stop Garunix. You can stop Skull Guardian. You can stop Lovely, but it loses to SP and everything else, and it's just bad. Uh, yeah. I think this card will just be terrible because of SP for a while now, unless the meta drastically changes. I mean, it's useless for Branded is kind of cool, but I'm not expecting that much. If we have a lot of Branded and you really have an issue with the deck, then you can throw this in as like your ace in the hole, but maybe it's a subpar choice because of that reason, or it has some very little merit, but it's it's horrific in like every other scenario. Next up, the Bestials. Let's move these together because they go hand in hand. They have some merit. They are effectively useless versus Fire King. Let me be clear. However, there are other decks in the meta, albeit when you go to tournament, not as many non-Fire decks. Versus tier, these are still strong because they put up bodies that also then do other stuff as well while clearing out the tier names a lot more effective than DD Crow. Uh, they can also be good as Labyrinth to shut off some of their follow-up, their resource game. Uh, you can hit the lovely Labyrinth, which will greatly turn off their ability to disrupt you, uh, and that's pretty good. And then versus Voiceless as well, it's okay because when they go revive low, if you Crow it, or Bistral it in this case, it, it can stop them. Although the same as we talked about with Crow and Bell, Right, if they have the trap already, they can still get to it, and it's not that big of a deal. Just keep in mind, like if you have a bunch of dead cards to side out because your deck is built for fire, you'd probably put these in. And unlike the crow and bell, at least these are bodies in field you could link with, which in most decks is very helpful. One cool thing about Magnumut is you can search Flame Burge off it, which may not be apparently the best thing in the world, but when you have the body up and you have easy access to something like Nightmare Phoenix, then you have a clear outlet to utilize the Flame Burge. Then adding it is actually pretty good. Next up is XYZ Encore. Let's think about why these cards are being played before. It was for Dweller, for Noir, and with those things not in the metagame anymore, really, then this card can just go in the bad, unplayable section. Now, it's almost a bit surprising that Dweller hasn't seen a huge resurgence in play. I just think of the thing that people can't use it, or it's not worth it to use it. In Rescue Ace, you have better options. 
you have to do a puzzle amino line to get it to resolve. I think that's probably the reason why, and yeah, it's okay. This would not, I would not side this first race at this point. Next up is Book of Moon, so very similar to Eclipse. However, it targets, so it's infinitely worse already. I guess it's a bit worse going second as well. I don't know, this is like Eclipse, but worse. So I'm going to put it in the bad section. I'm not going to rehash it again. Long video, so let's knock over the same things twice. Next up is Gamma. Now, Gamma, because it's a 1, is not one of the best staples, unfortunately. Just the huge deck building cost attached to it pretty much means you can only use it in tandem with Delta. That being said, obviously, when you resolve Gamma, it is insane. It is on par with probably nothing else. Probably just the best hand trap to resolve. But the deck building means you have to play with Delta, so you have to think Delta is worth to run itself. Otherwise, I think one driver, one Gamma is just way too much of a concession for Gamma to be worth it. While it is probably the best hand trap, it is not the best to this level where it's worth the deck building risk of adding the vanilla, where sometimes you win. Next up, we got Nightmare Ibli. Honestly, I forgot I had this on the list because I don't, I haven't thought about this at all. How would I rank Ibli? Uh, if you play against Fire, what, is, what do they do? I guess they don't have any great answers to it, right? Because if you stop the normal summon, they can't extend too much. They aren't playing Lingaribo right now. How would you get this? I don't know. This doesn't seem terrible, actually. I don't know how the hell you get to it. If you can get to it with the sprite deck. This seems like fine, but this almost feels like an engine card. As far as playing three of this in the deck, if you have your normal summon for a floodgate effect when you just have better floodgates, it's not worth it. I'm not sure I should rank it. Maybe I shouldn't have included it in the tier list because it's weird. It's not really a tech card. It's more like an engine searchable for Sprite. I'll, I'll just leave it off to the side. I'm not sure. Next up is Mourner. Okay, so I actually like Effect Negation a lot right now. You'll see where I rank Impermanent Veiler. But Mourner isn't the same. Now, the thing is, you're Impermanent, you're Veilering on Snake Eye Ash pretty much immediately. And you can't do that with Mourner. Now, Mourner can be used immediately when it comes to the Die Bell Star, and that can be very crippling. But... It, it, it's not versus Ash, uh, and that's big, right? Because if you're Ashing, if they go Snake Eye Ash and you have Mourner for Poplar, it's not the same thing, right? They get to do so much more without having a single extender. And yeah, unlike Imperm, you can also get Talents, though Veiler is the same. That, that, that Ash interaction is just the absolute biggest reason why I think this card's not as good. It will never carry by itself. You need to pair it. And even when it's paired, it's just okay. It's like Droll, but if they can search after the Droll resolves, it's just stopping the one card. So for that, its card is just not very good. It's a subpar choice. Next is Delta, or no, this is Epsilon. This is the one that stops trap cards, Psy Frames. Uh, if you're playing these, would you ever play this for Labyrinth? I'm going to say no, because with Arius and Rollback, they really do play through stuff is a lot better. And unlike Bell, you can't draw into it off Heat Soul or draw into it mid-combo for it to be really good. Even if I'm already playing Delta and Gamma, I probably wouldn't include it. It's like technically playable, but again, I wouldn't hyperfixate on Labyrinth at all anyways. Next up is Gozen Match. Uh, this card is pretty close to unplayable. Uh, because we're in a fire meta, right? Like, if there were enough fire links, or enough non-fire links, maybe this card would be playable. But, like, even if you keep them off SP, Phoenix can clear it relatively easily. Uh, Garunix deals with it so easily as well, with, with Deerin's help, obviously. Uh, even if they're cut off of SP and Zelantis and that stuff, like, Princess with the fire cards is still just brutal. Like, I'm not expecting to win with that. Yeah, Gozen is not worth a spot in my deck. Next up is Thrust. I think this card has some merit, and though I liked it a lot at the start of the format, I actually don't think it's a brilliant option right now, and it falls in the same line with Change of Heart and all these other breakers I was talking about. I just am scared of Anti Spell and Droll, and I, I think your non-engine shouldn't fall too prey to these, because your engine is already a little bit weak to them, right? And when people are playing into them, that's what makes these cards really killer. While you can build a deck around a thrust strategy and go second with breakers, and it very easily can work through Fire King, it's just such a risk when these are in the meta. And that's why it has some merit, but it, it's really risky. Next up is Retaliating C. This one was a weird one I pondered for a bit when we first announced the Snake Eye cards, because when they go original Sinful Snake Eye or whatever to someone from deck, you can Retaliating C. And then cards get banished, right? But then also they can't send for Snake Eye Ash or whatever. And there's a chance you completely catch your opponent off guard, and that's sick. However, if you Retaliating C and they have Flame Bridge in the field, if they go summon Flame Bridge first and then we win Sinful Spoil, and they saw it and use Flame Bridge effect, they can flame bridge or retaliating see in the spell trap card zone and you effectively accomplished nothing besides banishing those sinful spoils. And uh, that is not worth it. That huge risk makes it not good. There's obviously the talents thrust thing where they can just steal it, link it off, and it's no longer a threat. Uh, the card is has some interesting properties. It's not like the worst thing, but it's merit to not bring enough for me to put it here. When I say has some merit, I want it to be more than literally I want it to be more than a little bit. I want it to have actual bit of merit to it. So yeah, interesting choice, but ultimately there are too many play arounds that it's not worth it. Maybe if we get into a point in the meta where there's very common patterns of play and Retaliating C beats the retali that pattern of play, it could be a meta call for a specific tournament. But with the broad meta, unclear combo lines, 
and all such, this is not going to have a spot in the immediate future. Next up is Infinite Permanence, and I think this is probably one of the best two cards in the game right now as far as hand traps go. There's a good chance this can brick your opponents when they're playing Fire Kings, which is just bonkers to me. I hate, hate playing Fire King for that reason. Fire King can be very cool many times, but when you get Imperm and pass, it sucks. And it happens a lot on Dive Star and sometimes Snake of Ash. That's why Kieran can help a lot as well. Talents doesn't help play through it. And Callby can't beat it either, so this card is just nasty. And then this one's also good to pair, right? You can stop them just like that, or if you pair with Nib, it's broken. Or if you pair it even with another Veiler, it can be pretty good. Or with Ash, it's solid. Yeah, very good. I like this card a lot. Next up is Kurikara. This card has some merit, and it's largely because it's searchable. I think this card is typically pretty bad. However, being able to search off Snake Eye Ash, that has given it a place in the meta. Obviously, you can just side, side deck it in for something like Pearly. But the main merit it has is when they use Appaloos in the gate once, and after they use SP to banish, Kurikara can hit those two type of interrupts uh, and then trade upwards, while also applying a lot amount of damage on the field. Uh, and when you get into grind games, it's also just a huge body that revives from your opponent's grave. So if they have IP, or if they have even SP, or I don't know, just anything meaningful, you can start reviving their monsters to act disruption and bodies for a grind game. Very strong. But it's not every game state's like that. It's not a reliable thing that you always get to that position. And it's not a card I just want to hard draw for that reason. But as searchable utility, it can be very good. Now, the obvious downside is if you want to main deck this type of thing, is it's terrible to go draw to draw going first. Even if you full combo, if your opponent has a lot of strong power spells like talents or high engine count, um, you may have wanted a hand trip to stay alive and instead you're stuck with like a Kurikara. Especially if your hand has two bonfires and a Kurikara, so you have two bricks in your hand. And you may really wish you cut down those cards that were completely useless going first. Next up is Forbidden Lance. This is one of the few cards that can play through Imperm, but it, it can't play around like anything else. In theory, like there are maybe some like board breakers this would be decent against, but going into a field with this card is, is just straight up un unplayable. So this card is just bad. It, it's not going to be in anyone's deck and for a good reason. Okay, Ultimate Slayer. Another terrible card. I think it's just highly overrated. Could be cool to send, spin back their Appalooza, and then you get to send another card in the field to Grave. If their field is Appaloosa plus Arvada, you could force out a lot like that. And obviously they would just Arvada the Evil Twin Grave to not lose their fire count on field, unless they Kieran on hand, in which case. And then it also comes with the cost of breaking your deck and the card in your extra deck, which as we talked about, Super Poly is a pretty big cost. I think extra deck is rather tight right now, but it's just not great as a board breaker, right? I think there are better options. It's okay at, at clearing through fields, it's just there's better and then it has the same weaknesses of if you're trying to thrust for this it's just draws an issue like turning on their draw sucks and i spell obviously just makes this card in a, a, a blank which is what we want to avoid so yeah this card is a very subpar choice next up is skill drain okay where does skill drain fit i haven't thought about this if i'm playing fire king am i scared of my opponent from skill drain on me yeah it can be hard to resolve a Kieran to pop it. Outside of that, it's not that easy. You can put up big floaters pretty effectively, and Princess is still acts disruption. So Skill Drain will never carry the game, but it can keep people at bay or stop them from being truly combo-centric. Now, obviously, Snake Eye Ash can still trigger some of Flame Burge, and Link Rebo can actually force through your level 1 effects. So you can still do quite a bit under Skill Drain. It's just the heavy pushes you can't really do. Now, some people are playing Axis Code Talker, which means they can Axis Code Talker banish itself to kill Skill Drain. But otherwise, it's not the easiest thing in the world to clear. So if you have Skill Drain, it's not going to be enough to solo, but it will, if you're applying pressure, do something. That being said, there's probably better stuff to play, and it's not like the most amazing card versus Fire King. It's like playable, but I wouldn't recommend it very highly. Next up is Nibiru. I'd probably put this as first or second best card. This card... While it's unlikely to completely nullify the Snake Eye Ash combo by itself, it is insane when it gets paired with anything else. It's nuts when it goes first. And if your hand is playable, if you Nibiru them, it makes their field weak enough that oftentimes this engine is, is pretty good. Uh, and it's nice as well with the body in play. If you hit the body up, you can do a lot with it, right? That, that's you going to Charmers, which going second is really important. Uh, it's big enough for can attack over monsters as well. If I have an SP and you're trying to go to a grind game, although... That play obviously requires using the battle phase, which I, I, I'd i recommend avoiding. And then the other cool application is, I talked about it before, you can use this going second. It's very weird because the Flame Burge can bring back IP and then IP can link away for links number two. And then they summon twice off Flame Burge, that's four summons. Now a Princess can be five, a Karibo could be five, a Kieran could be five, a, a, a Kieran or a Garunix or any of those things. So there's plenty of ways for them to summon five times in a turn, right? They actually summon quite a bit. Uh, and when we see those games happening, Nibiru... While not an incredible card, can clear the field if there are any interrupts. Uh, sometimes versus P can be good, but 
primarily what it's good against is good for is just summoning a body. Uh, and it's cool when it gets crossed out. It's not completely dead in your turn, which is nice when you either hand trap would just be thrown into the grave immediately with no sort of upside. Next up, we've got Gravekeeper Inscription. So at, at first, when I looked at this format, I thought this card would be great. It would be like in tier element format uh, almost about a year ago this time where the cash decks would main three of this with three shifter and just be heavy anti-graveyard centric. But I think Fire can deal with this like, enough because you're putting bodies in fields enough of the time without using the graveyard effects that you can do stuff. You can make SP, you can make IP, you can make Apo. You can put enough pressure that Inscription is not enough to solo you. And uh, when you have a board and the Inscription you again, it's not the end of the world. It does help to play through fields. It's not like an unplayable card by any means, but it's not going to solo in the same way that it felt like it soloed an entire two turns against your elements. And it is worse than I thought. It also has weakness to stand, I spell, but when it resolves, it is pretty good and does work towards breaking the field. Now, obviously, this is deck dependent on what you're playing, but it's a, it is a card that has some merits to it. Uh, and if you're playing the right deck for it, there's a decent chance you're playing it in. That being said, it's not good enough to the point where if you can play it, you should always play it. Next up is Judgment. I'm going to also include Strike in here. And I'm going to quickly talk about some of them as well, because these are the last two cards here that you want to side in for going first, really. In most of these decks, you may have one slot designated towards these type of cards. Strike and Judgment are better in the case of Hand Trap Wars because you get direct value out of them. You are trading, you're often trying to see who go plus the most before trying to kill. Strike and Judgment are good at doing that. They're also a bit more flexible. And I think if we're seeing these very high heavy hand trap counts, this is the best option. However, if there are going to be some board breakers, some limit has merit to it too because it's the middle of the road. You can still turn this off with your own Snake Eye Ash. But if they have a Snake Eye Ash and you have some limit, they aren't going to be able to play through it. They're going to have to pass in the Poplar immediately. Unlike where Anaspell would have beat them. However, if they're very board breaker centric or if they're playing like Despia, Anaspell probably would have been better. Uh, maybe versus Despia, someone that's probably fine anyways because they don't deal with backer very well. But say like the board breaker, Fire King, Snake Eye deck, or just pure Snake Eye deck that plays board breakers, with like Engage and stuff in the deck, the summon limit can be pushed through. Stuff like Mind Control, Snatch Deal, if they have those, they can make a SP relatively quickly without summoning twice. And in those cases, this card will again falter, right? It's not terrible by any means. All of these are strong options, and we should see all these seeing play in side decks. This includes Strike. But yeah, no, uh, another powerful card is Soul Release that Anispel stops, Judgment stops, but the other two don't. That being said, Soul Release I actually didn't include on this list. I really should include Soul Release. I'm, I just I forgot about it. I, I forgot about it. I'm going to tell you guys. So those who skipped to see the end of the, the tier list won't see it. Unfortunately, I'll, I'll just tell you why I put Soul Release, and I'd put it in the subpart choice. So I know I just said it was pretty strong, but it was, I was almost like a, a gut, reflex to say, gut reflex to say it's pretty strong because in actuality, after having played with and against it a lot, I think it doesn't do enough a lot of the time. They'll still be the field on board, often in Appaloosa, or they'll have the Arvada or the, the IP, and then they'll probably be going for side deck cards in there plus the hand traps, right? So while that can be enough, it's not always enough. And then you obviously have huge weaknesses to Anti Spell, which I really dislike. I really want my side deck card to be functional versus that as well. And then the fact that it's not enough by itself. Like if I'm putting a card with these risks in it, I wanted to close out the game on the spot. And I don't think it is enough. Now, there are plenty of ways to play around Soul Release, where I think they play worse into everything else, which is why I don't focus on them too much. If Soul Release has become heavily popular in the meta, then you play on Soul Release by putting stuff like Kirin, not Kirin, like Runix or Arvada and Spell Trap cards on the Flame Burge and playing like that. And it makes something like Soul Release a lot less effective. Or if you Sunlight Wolf, add back the Garunix. Now, when you pop something, the Garunix comes out of hand instead. Now, there's no guarantee that this is entirely worth it, but these are options should we expect a lot of Soul Release being played. And I don't like the Soul Release has that play around that ability. I don't like that it loses the Anti Spell. I don't like that it's not always enough by itself. And it's just, yeah, Soul Release here is subpar choice. It's probably the top end of subpar choice. I think it's Super Poly. It's a trap. They seem very strong, but they're ultimately just not worth it. And for cards to do similar things, there's just typically better options. Yeah. Next up is Lightning Storm. And. There's nothing you want a Lightning Storm really as far as monsters go. I'm going to say it goes exactly where Duster is because it functions in the exact same premise. Uh, if you want more copies of Duster, you play two Lightning Storms or vice versa. But these really function as exact same cards and you're never really doing anything else with them. Next up is Ghost Reaper and Winter Cherries. This was something I did test a little bit. Hitting Promethean Princess can be kind of cool. It can decrease the capacity of their combo a bit and some of their interruptions and their grind game. However, they can still do plenty through it. Turns on their talents, which I don't love. So as a board breaker strategy, it's not that good. And as far as pairing them with other hand traps, it's not a great card to pair with. I'd rather pair other hand traps together. I think it just doesn't do enough. Sometimes it can be good, 
so it's su I'd say it's subpar, but it doesn't have enough merit for me to put it up here. I expect to maybe see in a couple deck lists, but not many. Bottom end of subpar is where it goes, I guess, like here. There's two hand traps that really don't, don't really hold up. Next up is Dimension Shifter. This card is nasty. I shouldn't have to say this for a year in a row now. This has been like one of the best cards ever. If this card's activated on you, you just sit there and cry. If you can use this, you should use it. And obviously in the decks, you can use it. If somebody uses it against you, you don't care. But as far as side deck cards, whatever go, this is a card that if you can, you will always include. It is so broken, man. So broken. Next up is Effect Veiler. So this is the last of the 12 hand traps I want to include in, in as many decks as I can. And I think it is probably around those, the power level of Veiler, or sorry, power, around the power level of Ash. I prefer Veiler and Imperm, but obviously this is weaker because it's weaker to call by, it's weaker to talents, and those are very real things, even though they may not seem like much. Specifically, talents. Talents is very popular right now, and I did main three for the UDS. I'm curious to see how much it's played across other topping deck lists over the last few weekends. We'll know by the time this video comes out, but that'll play a large part in it. If talents drops off a lot, then Veiler becomes a lot better, but I think the fact that so many people play three talents in their deck means it's Imperm with extra liability attached to it, which I don't love. Although it still is definitely worth it. It's a small enough of a downside that compared to these, it's just way better. The chance to brick them as well is just so nasty. Like, I've played so many games with this deck where I get Imperm or Veiler, I look at my hand and I'm like, that's it. <laughs> it's, it's a very sad life. Anyways, moving on, we got Rivalry of the Warlords. This one is a lot better than Gozen because the fire decks are very mixed mashed in terms of what they're comprised of. You got the Pyros and the Small Snake Eyes, the Dragon and Flame Burge. And then you got Beast Warrior and Wing Beast for the Fire King cards. And then Nightmare Phoenix of Fiend and Promethean Princesses of Fiend. He does the Spellcaster. They're very all over the place. So if you can play Rivalry, it's actually pretty good. So if you're playing like Labyrinth, for example, there is probably a reason to play this card. That being said, the decks that can use it aren't great and it's still a trap. I'll put, I'll put it in has some merit. It, it's, I'd say this card can do a lot more solo by itself than Skill Drain. But you know what? How am I outing this in Fire King? If you can clear your field, you start using Island. You Island and then you go Garunix, Sand, uh, Kieran, Revive, Ponix, Pops. You can deal with it. It's just like a slow process and it's a pain in the ass, but you can definitely get there. So if you don't need to apply as much pressure as you do a Skill Drain. You have to apply a lot less, but as long as you're doing something, Rivalry does... Obviously, you have to be able to play it, but I guess it's the same logic as other stuff like Inscription or Shifter. On second thought, this card's actually rather good. Maybe I, I thought about this very briefly, so if there's something I'm overlooking as to why this card isn't good, just let me know. But yeah, this seems actually rather nasty to be flipped on me. And if I'm a, if I'm a Fire King player and I see this, I'm going to be tilted. Next up is there can be only one, and this works almost adversely to Rivalry, unless there's a deck that is very strictly needing both same type and different types at the same time. You rarely see both be good at once, and we're at that right now. I think this card just isn't great. It's too easy to deal around. It's not part of choice, or just bad. I just put it bad. I don't know what I want this against. Like, I guess Labyrinth? Like, uh, that's just worse than other cards. I don't know. Next is Pancratops. This is another interesting one because it's a board breaker. Unlike other board breakers, it functions through Anna Spell, which is an important thing we were looking for. It can help you through Appaloosa because if you activate an effect and they go Apo, it forces through. It can do the same thing as Ogre where you can hit the their... IP as well, once in spell trap card zone, or you can chain it to the IP, but once about to link summon, and it works there. What's nice is you can threaten battle phase to attack. However, as I mentioned before, like with evenly matched, I really don't want to expend my battle phase. It's rather inefficient to do. However, in some cases, Dino Wrestler Pankratops can really get a lot of value by like going battle phase first, like threaten an attack, and then pop something else as well. It definitely has merits to it in not being weak to Anna Spell or actually just killing Anna Spell is very good too. It's not the most amazing thing versus Appaloosa because they if they you summon Panker Tops and they have Princess for it, which they probably will, it forces the Princess, but if you chain Pank, the Appaloosa will still negate it. And it's not like Ogre where it's from your hand in that regard. And it's not this perfect thing, but there absolutely is a reason to have it for going second. I can deal with all the random BS floodgates as well. So you can power through a Voices Voice negate. It can be what pushes through the barrier, or it can hit just a summon limit, mana spell, whatever is threatening you. Yeah, I think the card is fine, and it's a card that, although it's not in my deck, I could consider for sure. Next up is Spell Bounce. The reason this was good before was there were a lot of people doing plays on your turn with Lynx. And while that's true to some extent now, it's mostly popping on your turn. Princess and Kirin Arvada, though, all don't really interact with Spell Bounce. It would just be IP. And even then, it's not even a guaranteed thing in people's end board. So using it as a board breaker really wouldn't be that effective. Not that I really want to rely on board breakers right now. The other use would be as a defensive card, but it's not searchable by Thrust. And I think if you compare this to any of the other trap cards deciding going first, it's just drastically weaker than with these five by by wide margin so this card is just bad i think there's no real reason to play this in any deck at all lastly the skullmeister another hand trap and this is just bell and crow but even worse 
like hitting the princess, I'd at least like to crow it and get it removed from the game permanently when deal with it, but this just doesn't do that at all. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't like this card uh, one bit. I think it doesn't do a good job of being hand trapped, doesn't stop your opponent's plays. You can almost use it as a board breaker, but it's a really shit board breaker. It beats Anna Spell. Anyways, that's it. I'm curious as if you guys have any different opinions. Uh, or if I missed any other staples, I missed Soul Release, but a reminder, guys, I, I did put it uh, in the subpar choice. You can go back and listen to it a couple minutes ago while I talked about that. But let me know what you would rank differently if there's anything I missed. And also, I filmed this before the UDS tournament. Now that we've had the UDS tournament, Weiss's Costa Rica, I'm wondering what would change in this tier list. Have I been mostly right? Have I been wrong? Or if, the, if there's been some secret contender we didn't know about that will force everything to shift itself once again. So that can be interesting. If something shifts a lot, maybe I'll remake the video and talk about that. But for now, this is it. And again, if you enjoy these type of videos where I go on for quite a while, and rather in depth, my voice gets, my throat gets sore from all the talking. But if you really enjoy it, please let me know because it's, it's content that can pump out for you guys pretty much every format and it can be a great value. Yeah, and that's all. I will see you next time. Peace. Thank you guys for watching the video. A great way to support the channel is to get the TSX1 sleeves on TSX1.com. These are the sleeves I use at every event. They are fantastic quality. They feel really great to shuffle in your hand, your deck, fanning out your grave. They just slide really smoothly and they last the entire tournament. So you're not compromising quality either. If you use the code POTATO10 on the website, you'll get 10% off across everything.